Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Following the death of Hugo Chavez, his close friend and ally, Nicolas Maduro, won both the subsequent presidential election and the regional elections held late last year. Since then, it's all gone wrong. A newly energized and well-funded U.S.-backed operation is clearly underway on the streets of the country. Real economic and social problems are being exacerbated and exaggerated and street power is being deployed to delegitimize the government. For someone my age, it's all eerily familiar of the days of the original 9-11. This first 9-11 happened in 1973 in Chile, when the elected president, Salvador Allende, was overthrown in a CIA-backed operation. Following Allende's murder, the wholesale slaughter of his supporters, and a mass exodus out of the country of any Democrats who could get out the fascist dictatorship of General Pinochet then ruled the roost for the next quarter of a century. Chile today is ruled by a communist Christian Democrat coalition, the first supporting the government of Venezuela, the latter supporting the protesters on the streets. But Mercosur, an economic and political agreement of the South Americas, is clear about the situation and condemns the clear efforts to destabilize the democratic government of Venezuela. Joining us to make sense of the streets of Caracas is Francisco Domingo of the Venezuelan Solidarity Campaign. Francisco, looking at the news, there's a real parallel between what's happening uh, in Ukraine and Kiev and what's happening in Venezuela. It looks to me, as a veteran of these matters, like a pretty well-planned and orchestrated push to regime change in both countries. Is that how it looks to you? Uh, not only it looks that way, but actually it's been declared by the people who are actually organizing this. Uh, Leopoldo Lopez, the main person behind this, leading it, and Maria Corrida Machado, an MP of the opposition, and Antonio Ledesma, who is the elected mayor of Caracas, have said that declare that they want to decide to launch a campaign called La Salida, which in Spanish means the ousting. And um, with the proclaim, the clear aim to actually remove Maduro from office, before he ends his mandate in 2019, since they cannot win the vote, because they lost, as you said correctly in the introduction, they lost the presidential election in uh, April 2013 by 1.5%, which was close, but it was still a win. But they lost massively the municipal elections on the 8th of December by 12% difference. It was an landslide. And as a result of that, they came to the conclusion that this was not acceptable. I think that what exacerbated this was the fact that Maduro, um, you know, with the best of intentions in the world in order to, uh, for the good of the country, offered them a dialogue. And several sections of the position did respond very positively. I think this is designed not only to torpedo those possible collaboration and conversation and dialogue, but also perhaps push it enough, um, hard enough to overthrow the government. I think that's what it is. They must have taken a green light, I expect, from Washington for this. Is there any evidence of the United States' involvement in this? There is long-term and short-term evidence. Uh, Obama has just taken a very hard line, saying that he's very concerned about the violence in Venezuela and demanding that Maduro actually goes for a real dialogue. I don't know what he means by that. But, you know, Maduro has offered this real dialogue. Sections of the opposition have responded positively, and it's only a very small minority of people. The, the person who actually leads the... Uh, the uh, opposition, this effort now, is called Leopoldo Lopez. He is the leader of a political party called Voluntad Popular, the popular will, which in the last uh, municipal elections got only 6% of the vote. Mm. So there are a significant minority within that majority. And I don't think without the support of the United States, they would have gone for it. And the long-term evidence is this. Uh, since 2002, and there is hard evidence about this. this is public information more or less the united states through the national Endowment for democracy the international republican institute the national democratic institute has given the opposition in venezuela uh, 
120 million dollars, which if were, one were to translate it into British terms, that would be 1.2 billion dollars of money to Given actually overthrow, to to overthrow destabilize the government of Britain. I, I understand that Lopez has given himself in for arrest. What's, 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 what's about that? Um, well, he made very, I can put it, macho statements through Twitter that he was going to go for a confrontation and so on. Everybody was extremely worried. He called on demonstration. He got some supporters, about 5,000, which is small in terms of Venezuelan yeah. towns. But it was his supporters in his district. And rather than going for a confrontation, he decided to get himself in. Um, Maduro later on and Diosdado Cabello, you know, the two key people in the government, Diosdado Cabello is the president of the National Assembly, they, they said that, you know, they were extremely worried about he being assassinated by the right wing in order to cause this complication, this trouble, which will justify God knows what else. And um, so he gave his him, and the National Guard was surrounding the house all the time, the house where he was supposed to be in hiding, protecting him. When he came out, they followed him and protected him all the way until he gave himself in. And his wife, Lopez's wife, has gone on television and he actually uh, gave an interview to CNN where he confirmed this. So thanks to the government of Venezuela, you know, a repetition of what happened in 2002 where God knows who shoot fires, choke, kill people, uh, in order to cause the maximum havoc. Well, and yet the Pavlovian reaction of some predictable uh, sources is now being uh, played out. Amnesty International have this week called uh, for an action across the whole world for people to protest to President Maduro about the raid on the opposition headquarters. As you explain, it's a tiny fragment of an opposition, which is by definition, in any case, a minority of the population. Six percent, extremely radical. Amnesty has called on people to protest against Maduro's arrest of this man, uh, Lopez. How steady in the water is the ship of state in Venezuela? When you have the support of the United States, nothing can be very certain. And where the full power of the empire, to use more precise words, to be deployed fully against Venezuela, God knows what will happen. The, their complication is they cannot obtain significant support within inside the country to destabilize the government enough in order to cause trouble. The difficulty is that the government faces serious economic complications, and this has got to do with inheriting a very difficult economy which depends too heavily on oil, it's, got, it's not diversified at all, and because um, they are the victim of their own success because the government has given, has done so much redistribution of income since 1999 up to now. The 60% poorest part of the country actually has seen their income increase by more than 500%. And because there is no economic diversity, the result is that people have lots of money in their pockets and they haven't got things to buy. The result is the government has to import things, so the, the currency becomes very weak. And as a result of this, there is an official exchange rate, which is 6.30 bolivares, and there is a black market one, <coughs> which is 10 times that. Mm. The result is, you know, all sorts of complications, and people are using this deliberately. There is economic sabotage against the government, deliberately by sections of the right-wing business, like they did to Allende. There is overpricing, there is hoarding, and in terms of overpricing, um, they discovered the government when they went for uh, inspecting businesses, and shops and so on, big businesses. Um, the overpricing went to 100%, 200%, 1,000%, 2,000%. There was one case of 12,000%. So the moment Maduro began to do this, I mean, immediately the, the population supported him. And he said to the opposition, he said, right, I want you to discuss this matter with me because it's not acceptable. And many businesses actually have collaborated with the government. In order to, Maduro just now, literally two days ago, one day ago, signed a very good deal with Samsung or Samsung, the, you know, the electronic, electronic giant, giant. Yeah. and out of which uh, Venezuela is going to get significant amount of technology and computers mm. and so on. And Maduro just offered, because of this agreement with Samsung, um, a tablet to every single university in the yeah. country free of charge. So that gives you an idea of the potential, but also the dangers. The uh, comparison I drew in the introduction 
you and I uh, both remember it well, uh, this kind of street power feeding on economic and social dissatisfaction with the support of the US led to the murder of President Allende and uh, tens of thousands of others, the exile of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of others. At the time, the ultra-left used to demand of President Allende that he arm the people. I opposed this demand at the time, thinking that it would be a provocation that might provoke a coup. And of course, the coup happened anyway. What steps is President Maduro taking to defend the gains of the revolution? Um, I mean, your reference to Chile touches my heart because I'm Chilean myself. I'm a former exile, so I know very well what was done. And the power that can be deployed in the streets by fascist thugs is really, really powerful and can cause havoc. Um, my understanding is that the government is using all the legal and constitutional mechanisms which are totally sufficient as far as they are concerned in order to defend the revolution. And despite the pressure on the armed forces, despite provocations, infiltration, attempts to bribe some of them, God knows what, um, the unity of the armed forces behind the Bolivarian constitution is totally solid. Melendez, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, is a woman. Mm. Two days ago, she made the statement saying the armed forces, will, the Bolivarian armed forces in Venezuela, will not accept any government that doesn't come out from the democratic will of the people. So that's totally clear. There's been not one single general officer of any kind, at any level, that actually has expressed any um, dissent, dissatisfaction, dis disobedience or anything, which means that the solidity of the armed forces behind the project, which, you know, Chavez managed to galvanize and crystallize, is still entire. So it seems to me in that sense, it's totally uh, sufficient. The complication is that the masses want to participate, defending the revolution, organizing peace marches, and the thugs are being organized to set upon them and killing some of them. It just happened in Valencia, you know, yesterday. Well, it's a very dangerous moment. Uh, not just for Venezuela, but for all of Latin America, because, of course, if such a thing were to happen in Venezuela, a, rep a repetition of the Chilean events of 1973, then none of the democratic governments in Latin America would be safe. So we'll have to keep a watching brief on that. Francisco Domingo of the Venezuelan Solidarity Campaign, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up after the break, his original name was Little, but the shadow that he cast has proved long. It's the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. 49 years ago, on stage in a ballroom in Harlem, Malcolm X was gunned down and killed by three black assassins from the rival nation of Islam. Malcolm was just 39 years old. He had been a criminal who discovered a rather exotic offshoot of Islam then turned to mainstream Islam and had just begun to reach out to other poor American communities and to those white students being radicalized by the war in Vietnam. His actual name was Malcolm Little, but he had the potential to be truly great, and in death he has become so. Today we're looking at the great Malcolm X with one of Britain's foremost black writers, the author and pan-Africanist Onyeka Nubia. Onyeka, thanks very much Thank for you. joining us 49 years ago, yes. almost exactly. Uh, Malcolm X was gunned down in rather mysterious circumstances. Yes. People went to prison. Indeed, uh, the last of the assassins was only released in uh, 2010. Whilst it's obvious to me, as a white person, that Malcolm could have been a Mandela figure, could have emerged as a Mandela figure, a truly uh, world-class political operator, it is somehow not very safe to declare yourself an admirer of Malcolm X. Whilst Martin Luther King, for example, it's kind of uh, obligatory mm. to pay your respects to him. Why do you think that is? What was that about Malcolm that made him edgy? I mean, the first thing is that Malcolm is one of the most maligned and misunderstood individuals of the 20th century. And uh, now we move into the 21st century. We are aware that there is a vacancy in terms of such individuals with such honesty, character, and fortitude. And to understand Malcolm, we must contextualize him, because we cannot understand him out of context. No man is, can be misunderstood without context. 
Malcolm's father was a member of the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. This was the Marcus Garvey's organization. Mm. It was the largest organization of Africans um, in the diaspora within the history of the 20th or the 21st century. It's never spoken about as such, right? Now, Earl Little was, um, uh, first of all, a composite organizer and um, a well-voiced member of that organization and was killed probably by the Klan or other members of other organizations whilst in the pursuit of the gains of that organization. And whilst it had conservative ideas, its appeal to the mass of African Americans was far more than most Marxist or socialist organizations have been mm. then or since. So Malcolm grew up as effectively a Garveyite. His mother also was a Garveyite. Yeah? And when um, uh, growing up as a Garveyite, um, he lost his way. He became very confused, disenfranchised with himself in a way dislocated from himself and took to a life of crime, as many young people did. And then received an epiphany um, whilst in prison uh, and then joined the Nation of Islam. Now, Malcolm was already being trained and moved into that organization through family connections. Ella Collins had already raised money for Elijah Muhammad many decades before. Wilfred Little had already um, established a relationship. His brothers, Reginald and Philbert, had already were moving towards that movement. And then Malcolm was adopted really as a favored son and became national spokesperson for the organization and really pushed what was essentially a conservative organization into the mainstream of American politi politics. And he did this very carefully and clearly by observing what was happening in politics and integrating and offering an alternative perspective. At that point in the 60s, the civil rights movement represented the only voice. Mm. And in many ways, though, we think of the civil rights movement as rather a conservative affair. In 1955, it was not such. Yeah. The civil rights movement was considered to be quite radical. As it moved forward into the middle part of the 1950s towards the 1960s, the young became disenfranchised by it. And immediately, the Nation of Islam could see offering an alternative to that particular form of conservatism. So Malcolm and Elijah devised a strategy, and their strategy was to represent themselves as the radicals, to represent themselves as the, inverted commas, violent alternative. Now, that violent alternative wasn't marked out by any reality. The Nation of Islam was not engaged in any violent activities against the American government. Um, the Nation of Islam was not involved in any violent killings or terrorist activities against the American government. It was a rhetoric that was offered so that that would be an uh, if you like, a different alternative to what was happening in the civil rights movement. It was a strategy. It was methodology. It was gamesmanship, if you like. However, with Malcolm, the label stuck, when in fact it had been nothing more than strategy. Because we paint um, the Nation of Islam or Malcolm as the violent and the civil rights movement as in was the non-violent. But in fact, it's not quite as simple as that, as I'm sure you may be aware. Robert F. Williams, for example, in the Deacons of Defense, was a military organization working within the civil rights movement of trained um, ex-Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans, who were well prepared and willing to conduct violent activities in defense and protection of civil rights workers. The Deacons of Defense worked from the beginning, from the 50s, along with the Montgomery Improvement Association, along with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, along with CORE, along with SNCC, and within CORE, and within SNCC, they had their own military groups that were working for the defense of freedom riders. None of this is going to be promoted, of course, because the civil rights movement promoted itself as a non-violent organization. Mm. The Nation of Islam, on the other hand, was a very conservative, non-violent organization in terms of how it operated with the government, etc. But that wasn't an image that was going to be represented either. So what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, we've got Malcolm as the violent demagogue, mm. and on the other, we've got Martin Luther King as the non-violent, innocent saint. But in fact, in neither case is such idea based on any kind of reality. So this perception that we have of both individuals is actually quite wrong. But in our uh, often polarized perspective, we're looking for a god and then we're looking for a devil. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, Malcolm falls into the devil. But category. it's a false. Uh, it's dichotomy. a false notion. That's the uh, the the point. Once upon a time, I I asked Fidel Castro, who had been telling me this remarkable story of how. Malcolm had yes. guarded him in the Teresa Hotel yes. in uh, Harlem when the Cuban revolutionary leadership yes. had been thrown out of their hotel That's in Madison right. Avenue. Yes. I asked him, he told me some wonderful stories which we don't have time to go into about Malcolm. And so f actually it was triggered by the sight of Bill Clinton out jogging in a Malcolm X yes, baseball cap. Indeed. Was this 92 or 93 yes, or something like that? Yeah. Fidel stopped. Yeah. Dead. The CNN was on in the corner. Yes. He stopped dead and yeah. saw when he saw the American president with the Malcolm yes. 
ex-baseball cap, and he made the point that he never thought that the day would ever come Indeed. when a U.S. president. Indeed. So finally I asked him, so what did you think of Malcolm? Mm. And Fidel Castro, one of the world's most edgy, dangerous men, yes. said, Malcolm was a very great man, yeah. but he was a little dangerous. Yes. Uh, but he meant it yes. as a compliment. Of course. If Malcolm had lived, and of course this is speculation, how different would the situation of black people and the relationships between black people and others in the United States have been? Well, Matt, the important thing is that in the, between the 1955 to about 1974, a whole generation of young people, both black and white, were removed from the American scene. Um, we could start with Edgar Myers, Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers, Lee, um, Huey P. Newton, um, Bobby Seale, <laughs> he goes on and on the list of individuals that removed. Fred Hampton, George Jackson, a whole, um, a whole rafter of individuals um, working um, on all levels were removed. This generation of people uh, would have made not only America, but the whole world a very, 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 very different place. So we have to look at this thing not only as an individual thing, but a question of social engineering. There was a fear that this generation of young people, some as young as 16 or 17, highly politicized, highly intelligent and highly articulate, were very dangerous. So to remove this whole generation of people of which Malcolm X was a part, very young, 39 when he died? In his, yes, in his 20s when he's active. This, this, this whole generation of people is very dangerous because they would then represent, if you like, the mainstream of ideological thought. And there's always the, um, the concern of that sort of politics being in the mainstream, on the fringe, on the edge of society, is acceptable to a certain extent because then you can always demonise them. But if you have these individuals as the mainstream of political thought and that political thought, that mainstream political thought is radicalised and revolutionised, then that becomes very dangerous to the whole way in which Western society operates, or people may feel the way in which Western society operates. So that's why Malcolm had to be removed. It was when he was internationalizing the situation and internationalizing it so well that he was gunned down. Um, and people say, oh, it was a nation. No, no. He says, and we must take his word for it, that this is beyond the nation, in his own words. And he's no fool. He's no idiot. He says it's beyond the nation. Yes, why he was being removed. When he was meeting Kwame Nkrumah and Secretary in Africa, and then his whistle stop tour around North Africa, yeah. and then... Ben Bella, yes, and then, Nasser, yeah, exactly, uh, yes. He, he was internationalizing, right. and he was crossing class and crossing yes. Color. ethnic That's right. uh, boundaries yes. inside the yeah. United States. And it was his ability to be able to show relationships between these different struggles that made him particularly dangerous. At a time when America was presenting itself, as a democratic voice and face of the world, he was able to show, no, actually, in your back door, you're doing this to 20-odd yeah. million people that yeah. you've denied rights to for the last two or 300 years. Wait. This was very, very frightening and very dangerous to a country that's purporting itself as the representation of the divine and perfect upon the face of the earth. Are you saying that the civil rights movement at the time was unable to see that? Well, I think, but that even when we say that, we must be careful, because Paul Robeson, even in the 50s, understood the power of the United Nations. And even he was petitioning. Mm. Uh, and this is really the forerunner of the civil rights movement. So what I'm saying is that Malcolm, by the time he left the nation, by 62 or 63, he was already thinking how he can work with the civil rights movement. I don't think he saw himself as being separate, but as being part of a more concerted effort. And that made him dangerous. When he was opposed to it, from a strategic perspective or a political perspective, that therefore he could be marginalised. But when he was willing to work with whomever he was willing to work with in order to get the job done, that made him very dangerous. Because then it wasn't ideology that was governing his thought process, mm. but strategy and method. And that's different. Well, we lost Malcolm, but we got Barack Obama. Onyeka, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for joining us on the Sputnik. <laughs> now it's your turn through social media to tell us what you're thinking. Not much time, uh, Gayatri, so give me your best couple. I found this picture on, on Twitter which portrays Leopoldo Lopez, the opposition leader, as an economist, professor, medal-winning athlete, and even descendant of Simon Bolivar, versus Nicolas Maduro, the president, as just a bus driver, which is so despicable, to which Clive Griffin responds, Jesus was a carpenter, Prophet Muhammad was a shepherd, shepherd and a merchant. Follow inspirational leaders, not career politicians. Oh, that's very good. Listen. Actually, I knew Nicolas Maduro when he was a bus driver. And it's one of the greatest qualifications that he has, that he was an industrial worker who's now become the president of the republic. Indeed. How great could Malcolm X have become? To which Polly Walnuts responds, 
he could have rivaled Mandela in being a symbol. He was killed because of his rising appeal globally. If you think about it, he was 39 when he died. He might have lived and been politically active for another 40 years. Oh, at least, like Mandela, more. yeah. Maybe 50 years. And he would have developed, his fame and worldwide reach would yeah. have developed. Yeah. Everything could have been different. It might have been him in the White House instead of, <laughs> instead of Obama. Barack Obama. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that's all we've got time for this Which, part. unfortunately, means that's the end of the show. You know how to reach us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can find us on Sputnik on Russia Today. Goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.